one of the reasons we worship at church is so that we'll know how to do it at home. So what we do here, we do at home. What we do at home, we do here. And God in the Bible has united the home and the church to where you almost can't tell the difference. So as we learn how to sing praises to Him, as we learn the songs, we take them home and we sing them there. As we do the Bible study, we take it home and we do it there. The Bible study that we present here, we call it the sermon. The sermon. It's a very spiritual time. It's a Bible study that we learn and listen to God and then we take that home and we do the same thing at home. We learn how to do it at home. So we do it at home, we do it here, we do it at home, we do it here, we do it here, we do it at home. And this is a time when we learn how to worship God, whether it's in the church or whether it's at the house. And so would you pray today as we talk to God, and I'm going to not pray for just a couple of minutes and let you pray first and then I'll close this in prayer. But as you pray today, would you ask God to teach us and help us to turn our homes into a place of worship for Jesus Christ? Would you bow with me, please? Father, you are worthy of praise, glory and honor and majesty and power. Lord Jesus, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the light of the world. You're the bread of life. You're the living water. You're firstborn from the dead. You're the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. You're the Son of God. And Holy Spirit of God who dwells in us, you're the lifter of our head, you're a provider. You're the friend of the bridegroom, Jesus. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, and who is to come. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. Lord, we pray you'd be with us today as we study the word, as we study your scriptures, and we pray that you'd teach us great things and mighty things that we know not. Lord, would you help us to apply it to our lives and to our homes. And we thank you and we praise you in Christ's name, the name above every name, Jesus. Amen. Now, as we pray in church, we play that music so that we don't have dead space because it's so awkward to the people. If it's just completely quiet like this and we pray for two or three minutes, it gets awkward. If it gets awkward in your house when you're praying together, you, one of you stand up and hum. But let's don't get so formal that we leave us out of the prayer. We come to worship a living God. And if Jesus Christ was here today and if he was preaching this message, if he was in our service, it would be an exciting, fun time. Make it fun and exciting in your homes also.
outside, everything is falling. The leaves, the light, the snow. But inside, every heart is longing for a thrill of hope. You see that star up in the sky? Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Christmas, looking forward. Christmas is looking forward. Christmas began at church. The very first Christmas began at the church. It's going to move quickly to the home. And you can't tell the difference between it, but it began at church. Christmas Looking forward, God does something at the very beginning. He always works with the church in the New Testament. Now, we talk, about, we talk about watching Israel, and we should. You should watch Israel to see what God's doing, see God's timetable. However, when you watch Israel, you're watching the big picture. You're watching the years. You're watching the month. But when you watch the church, you're watching the days and the hours. Israel is the long overhaul picture. Israel became a nation... May 14, 1948, again. May 14, 1948, that was a big deal. As we're watching Israel, we're watching God's plan. We see, we're watching what God is starting to do again, and Israel's back. That's a big deal. 
Jerusalem became the capital of Israel just not very long ago. That's a big deal. As you watch Israel, you're watching the big picture of God in his plan. However, God never does anything without the New Testament church. That's the bride of Christ. That's when God gets real personal. That's when God gets down to the timing of the days and the hours and the, month, the minutes and the seconds as we see God moving within the church. Now, we talk about God moving in Israel all the time, looking at Israel, but look at the church. Don't forget the church. Don't forget the bride of Christ. Israel's God's people, and he's coming back to get them later. But the church is the bride of Christ, and he never does anything without the church. If you want to see what God is doing personally, watch the church. God began Christmas for the world at the church. We're going to study this in just a moment. That's the beginning, and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I've told you this story before, but the first time I ever met Jeannie, my house burned down. I'd gone to the movies to watch Romeo and Juliet. That's got to be a sign from God. I was literally watching Romeo and Juliet at the movies. The first time it ever came out, me and my roommates had gone to the movies. Guy comes down the hallway, down the aisle at the movie theater with a flashlight, and I can hear him coming. Alan Burkhalter. Is there an Alan Burkhalter in the crowd? That is never a good sign. They're not wanting to give you a prize. I held my hand up, and he came over there, and he shined it right, right smack in my face, and he said, Are you Alan Burkhalter? And I said, Yes, I am. He said, Your house just burned down. The police are calling, looking for you. I jumped up and ran out, and I left my roommates there. I forgot I had them. I drove as fast as I could to get to the house, and sure enough, when I got to the house, the place was on fire. The fire department was there, and when they finished, it had burned down. It was wintertime. And it was snowing. And we're standing out in front of our house, a burned down hulk with snow raining down on our heads with no place to go. And this lady shows up from down the street, good looking girl. I don't think I'd ever seen her before. She's got four cups, empty cups and a pot of coffee. She passes the cup out to each one of us, pours us all coffee. We drink it, she refills it, and she leaves. I asked one of the guys, I said, who was that? One of them said, I don't know. One of them said, I think she may go to our Bible study at Tape Class. There's a hundred and something people at that Bible study. I think she may go there, but I'd never seen her. I thought, wow, that was kind of cool. So we had to have a place to live, so we got another place to live in about a week, and we moved into it, and Jeannie lived right across the alley. Now you talk about God. Going from Romeo and Juliet to she's living across the alley, and she invited us for Thanksgiving because we weren't really prepared for that. And we went over to her house and ate Thanksgiving. I thought, I need to really, I need to get to know this girl. That was the beginning of my relationship with Jeannie. It got bigger and better after that. This is the beginning of God's relationship with the world at Christmas time. And it gets bigger and better after that, go with me to Luke chapter 1. Starting in verse 5, we're going to read through verse 9. Christmas, looking forward. The beginning of Christmas is at the church. God never does anything without you. You need to remember that. You are the bride of Christ and you're very important to Him. And He never does anything without you. In verse 5, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, his name means, Zacharias, name means God remembers. Now, some of your Bibles will say Zachariah, and some of your Bibles will say Zacharias. A-S. Zachariah's Hebrew name is Zachariah. His Greek name is Zacharias, and it just depends on which one they're quoting, but this is Zachariah. We're going to call him Zach to cut to the chase. It was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. There were politics in those days. There's politics nowadays. There's always politics, and they're never good. There's always politicians. There's always politics going on. God just bypasses that. He uses that 
but he never focuses on that. God is not Democratic or Republican. He's independent. There were in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. David had set up the divisions where they would go for a week and spend a week in Jerusalem. They would have to, wherever they were, wherever they lived in Jerusalem, I mean in, in Judea or Israel, they would move to Jerusalem for a week and spend a week there doing their job and then they would go home. He had them divided up into 14 divisions. This is Abijah's division. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. In other words, they never sinned. Now, do you believe that? I believe it. He was a preacher, and preachers are perfect. And if you want to know the truth about that, ask Jeannie, the love of my life. <laughs> She'll tell you different. What this says is they were both righteous. They were saved. In the Old Testament, you accept Christ. In the New Testament, you accept Christ. In the Old Testament, you look forward to Christ. In the New Testament, you look backwards to Christ. You have to accept Christ to go to heaven. You cannot be righteous except by the righteousness of God living inside of you. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless because when you are a Christian, God does not charge sin to your account. You are saved and forgiven. And what it says right here is these people were both saved and forgiven. The reason it says that is because the high priest of the temple was not. He was a hireling. He had bought the position from the Romans. He had paid the most amount of money to get the position. And all the, the high priest council that worked for him were hirelings and they were lost. Called themselves men of God and they were heathens. They had bought the position and they worshiped gold and not God. We have a lot of that today. God says, I'm looking for some men that will follow me. I'm looking for some people, some average church members that are righteous before me, who walk blameless. Not that you're sinless, but God sees you as blameless. All of your sins are forgiven. They're put away as far as the east is from the west. They're thrown into the furthest part of the ocean. And this is Zach and Elizabeth. They're both righteous before God, walking all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child. Because Elizabeth was barren. Well, now that's getting personal. They didn't have any kids. And whose fault was it? <laughs> Dr. Luke is giving you his medical perspective. This is a doctor, an MD, that's writing the book, the book of Luke. This is Dr. Luke writing to you and telling you why they didn't have any children. Elizabeth was barren. They were both well advanced in years. Let's just say it personally. They were old. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So let's talk about this for just a moment. It came his group's turn to serve at the temple for a week. During that week, they would cast lots to see what jobs the priests were going to do because the, there were a lot of priests at that time there were a lot of jobs in the temple and you, there were so many priests that you would only get to go inside <clears throat> the temple building itself the edifice one time in your life because there were that many priests and he's old now and he's never he's never done this before and his lot falls to do what burn incense he actually gets in to go into the holy place, the building of God, which is a very, very big deal. We don't know if he'd been in there once before or not, but this is a big, big deal. He's never burned incense before. And the lot falls to him to get to burn incense. He gets to go into the temple. I think it's the first time he's probably ever been. And he is excited. He's also old. Now let's take a look and see what's going on here because I want you to see the picture of the church. This is point number one. This is the picture of the church. 
Let's take a look at these pictures we've got up here on the screen. This is the temple courtyard. This is the women's court right here. As you go through these gates, you go up these stairs right here. Through these gates, you go into the courtyard back here where they're doing the sacrifices. The priests are doing the sacrifices. And then the temple itself is right back here. But this is the women's courtyard where everybody's going to gather up as they, as they burn incense inside the temple itself, inside the building itself. You couldn't go in there. Only a priest could go in there. And he could only go in there when the lot fell to him. So Zacharias has gone up these stairs into the priest courtyard where they have finished the sacrifices and he's going to go into the temple. Now, hold that. Okay, we'll do that. As he goes into the temple, this is what he's going to see. To the right is the showbread. It's set up and ready to eat. It's got actual hot bread on it. They change it out every day. This is so you can fellowship with God. This is the showbread to the right. To the left is the light, the candlestick, the lampstand. Right in front is the altar of incense, and he has to take some coals from outside off the altar, put them on this, and then he pours incense on it. As he's doing that, Gabriel is going to stand right there on the right-hand side. Do you have a bigger picture of the temple? Okay there's, okay, there's the temple itself. There's the courtyard. That's the courtyard right there of the Gentiles. And they're going to go up these stairs and go into the court of the women. And back here is where they're going to be doing the sacrifices, and then you go into the temple. They have finished the sacrifices back here, and the, the choir and the orchestra has played on these steps right here, and everybody is listening. If you want to go hear some of the best music in the world, you would go to the temple and listen to the orchestra and the choir sing while they were offering the sacrifices. While the priests are actually sacrificing the animals in this courtyard right here, the orchestra and the choir are standing on these steps right here. This is a big court, the court of the Gentiles. Only, only Jews could go in here, and they would go up into here. And if you wanted to listen to the music, you could go every day, twice a day if you wanted to. If you were visiting Israel, it's a really big deal. You get to go to the Boston Pops right there. Okay, would you go back with me to uh, the first picture you showed, David? First one. That's the steps where the orchestra and the, the choir is going to sing. And as they burn, as he burns the incense, going in, here's the way it worked. The priest, at 3 o'clock, the priest would start the sacrifice. They would kill the animal. They'd cut its throat. They would catch the blood, and then they would sacrifice that thing. It, it took about 20 minutes to get that thing butchered up and put on the altar. They'd put it on the altar right back here. And as they're doing that... The people are in this courtyard right here, and the choir and the orchestra are playing and singing this beautiful worship music. When they finish that, then the next priest goes into the building itself and changes out the showbread right in there. And then the next priest goes in. Give me the second picture. First priest goes in and changes that, and then he comes out. Second priest goes in, and he does, he does this and goes out. And then lastly, this priest goes in and changes or, or pours the altar, uh, the incense on the altar, and as they do that, everybody in that women's courtyard, first picture, everybody is out here praying. There's no more music. Everybody is out here praying while he's doing the altar of incense. It doesn't take very long to do that. And then he comes back out. But on this particular day, it took him an extra long period of time. Point number one, this is the picture of the church. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Why does God come to the temple to talk to Zach? Because when he talks to Mary, he's going to go to her house. When he talks to Joseph, he's going to go to the house. Why didn't he go to Zach's house and talk to him? And he tells him, you're going to have a baby. But he doesn't tell him that at his house. He goes to the temple to tell him. And Zach is a priest. And the angel is going to talk to the priest at the temple. Now look at 1 Corinthians 3, 16. What? Do you not know that you, that you, that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God lives inside of you? See, this is going to be a picture of the church. This is going to be a picture of you. This is going to be a picture of the corporate church. As we go to the temple today and see Zach there, 
And we talk about Zacharias and his wife. We're going to be talking about the body of Christ because she's going to have a baby. He's going to help. It takes two. We're going to talk about the body of Christ. We're going to talk about the priest. What? Know you not that you are the temple of God? 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. Coming to him as to a living stone, indeed rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, talking about Christ, rejected, he's the chief cornerstone. But you also, as living stones, see you're part of the temple, you're the church of God, are being built up as a spiritual house, a what? A holy what? A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is a picture of the church. Zacharias at the temple is a picture of the church. It's not a picture of Israel. This is a picture of you. You are the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in you. And you are living stones built up as the holy temple of God. You are a king priest of the order of Jesus Christ. This is a picture of the church. This is personal. Let's read it again. There were in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, just a certain priest. He's nobody special. He's just a saved man. He's one of God's saved chosen. But he's a certain priest. He's not any anything special priest. Named Zacharias. God remembers. That's what his name means. God remembers your prayers. He's been praying all these years. God didn't lose them. God's been storing them up. God remembers your prayers. Named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. And they were a family together. And they were both righteous before God. They were both righteous before God. God didn't forget the wife. Why does he put the wife in this, in this mix? Because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is his wife. And he wants you to know that this is a picture of you. This is a picture of the church. This isn't just the priest. This is the priest and his wife. And they're both saved. And they're old. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God, in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And he was excited. That brings us to point number two. Prayer is important to God. Your prayers are important. In the big scheme of God's plan, your little old prayer is important to God. Your little bitty old prayer of little bitty old you of a certain priest of the order of uh huh is important to God. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And the hour of incense is a picture of prayer where you pour on this, this beautiful perfume this sweet smelling perfume onto the altar, the coals of the body of the lamb, you pour that perfume on that altar of the, of the uh, coals, and it fills up the temple, just fills it up, completely fills it up, it gets all over everything. At that time, the people are outside doing what in verse 10? They're praying. It says, the hour of incense. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. On the right side of the altar of prayer. When Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, you think. Fear fell upon him. I love God. I love his understatement. There's this angel that, that, that appears. and What's his name? He's going to tell you his name in a minute. But what's his name? Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. This is Gabriel. And as Zacharias doing his thing, just as a regular thing, Gabriel shows up. Stands right there beside him. Boom! The place lights up. I mean, lights up, lights up. And he goes, 
don't be afraid. Yes, sir. Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Nathan said to him, do not be afraid, God remembers, for your prayer is heard. Do not be afraid, Zacharias, God remembers, your prayer is heard. Your little old prayer, your prayer, your individual prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, you shall call his name John. You're going to have great joy. Point number two, prayer is important for what's coming. What's coming? This is the first Christmas. What's coming? Jesus! What's Christmas all about? What's the reason for the season? Jesus. I saw a sign yesterday. It didn't say Jesus is the reason for the season. It said Jesus is the season. What's coming? Jesus is coming. Your prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth is going to bury your son. And this son is going to be part of the big plan of Jesus Christ. Prayer is important for the coming of Christ. Prayer is important for the coming of Christ. Now there's a second coming. Coming. Christ is coming again. Christmas is looking forward. What does prayer do for us? What does prayer do for me and what does it do for you? I know God hears it and I know what God does in His great big plan, but what does it do for you and me? Well, it makes us ready. Jesus, when He's out in the Garden of Gethsemane with His apostles, said, you guys need to pray lest you fall into temptation. You guys need to pray. Prayer helps us. Get ready for what's coming. I can tell you what's coming. Christ is coming. Now, I've been preaching on the second coming of Christ for the last few weeks, and I've had several of you come and tell me. Now, listen carefully. I've had several of you come and tell me. You thought it was important enough to come and tell me this. I'm not sure I'm ready for Christ to come. I've got some grandkids. I've got some kids. One of you told me I, I'm not married yet. I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready for Christ to come. We better get ready for Christ to come. What does prayer do for us? Now that's not unnatural for you not to be ready. That's not unnatural for God's people to want to see a family. That's not unnatural. However, not my will, but thine be done, O Lord. What does prayer do for us? It gets us ready. And I'm telling you, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, this church, but more importantly, the church in the United States, is not ready for Christ to come. We're not even looking for Him. We don't even want Him to come. We better get ready. What did we do to get ready? We pray. Your prayer is heard. This is corporate prayer. This is individual prayer. This is Zach praying his prayer. Elizabeth praying her prayer. And this is the people outside in the courtyard of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ praying their prayer. Prayer makes us ready. Verse 10, would you underline it? They were praying outside. Verse 13, would you underline it? Your prayer is heard. And that brings us to the last point, the power of the Holy Spirit inside the church of God. When God gets ready to come, you're going to see revelation like you've never seen it before. He's, God's going to use, and God does use, every form of revelation He has to tell you He's coming. At the first coming of Christ at Christmas, God used prophecy, God used angels, God used scripture, God used people, God used the Gentiles in the form of the wise men. God used every form of revelation that he had to tell you he's coming. Hey, get ready, I'm coming. God used shepherds. God used wise men. He, he used the lowly, he used the high, he used the kings. 
He used the scripture. He used the prophecy. He used the angels. He used heaven to sing. He used every form of revelation he's got to tell the world, I'm coming. You're about to see that again. He's already started. He's already started. You look at the big picture, he's already started. You look at Israel, he's already started. Now who we're watching is the church. What's he going to do inside the church? Let's look at what he did here, starting in verse 11. He's going to speak to the preachers. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to Zach, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled. Fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zach. Do not be afraid, God remembers, for your prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. You're going to have great joy and gladness, at his, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and this is your son. He's going to be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he'll also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before Jesus, the Christ, in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the, Lord, of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said, wow! No, he didn't. That's what he should have said. You want to hear what the preacher said? How shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. Here's what Zach said. Oh, brother. You've waited all these years to do it and now I'm old? Pfft. Too late. I don't want it. Too late, God. And the preacher is mad. Where's God going to start in the church? He's going to start with the preachers. He's going to start with the preachers. As you watch the church, you start to watch the preachers inside the church. As God talks to the preachers, then the preachers are going to talk to the people. Watch this. <laughs> this is the funny part. Verse 18, Zechariah said, how do I know this? I've been waiting all this time and it hadn't happened yet. And I've been praying all these years and it hadn't happened yet. How do I know this? I'm old. And my wife, God bless her, she's old too. The angel answered. Now, who is this angel? The angel answered and said, I am Gabriel. Hebrew, Gabriel, hero of God. That's what the word means, hero of God who stands in the presence of God. I stand before the throne and I was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. Why aren't you glad? Behold, you will be mute, not be able to speak until the day these things take place. Now, I want to tell you, not only could he not talk, he couldn't hear. The reason I know that is because later on, when they, tell him, when they talk to him about his son's name, they make signs to him. Now, unless they're from West Texas and you're deaf in your right eye, that means something. He couldn't hear or he couldn't speak. And Gabriel said, okay, preacher. That's bad for preachers. Because you do not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their own time. People waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. He came out and he could not speak to them. They perceived he'd seen a vision in the temple. That's when the preacher can't talk, something has happened. For he beckoned to them and, and remained speechless. He made signs to them. Preachers are supposed to tell you what God said. And he did, but he couldn't speak. You watch the church and you watch when God starts getting a hold of the men of God in the church. You watch the church and see what God's doing with the leadership of the church. Because that's the first thing he's going to start with. Verse 13, you're going to see supernatural answers to your prayers that you've been waiting for. This is You watch the church and you watch God inside the church. In verse 13, your prayer is heard. 
After all these years, your prayer's heard, you're going to have a son, and this is going to be a supernatural answer to this prayer. Verse 14. There's going to be great joy and excitement. Verse 14. This is God. This is a biblical principle inside the church. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. You know what the church needs? We need a good dose of the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. We need a mighty moving of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, inside the church, inside our homes, inside our hearts. And we can have it right now. Now let me tell you what happens when that happens. You get the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is love, joy, peace. I'll take the first three. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You start seeing the Holy Spirit move in great power. You start seeing the church full of joy and excitement, and the place gets absolutely full because when you come, God is here. Verse 14, you will have great joy and gladness. Many's go many are going to rejoice. Prophecy will be fulfilled. Written prophecy that God says, I'm coming. Starting in verse 15. For your son will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither strong drink nor wine. He'll also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Many are going to turn to the Lord. Many are going to get saved. Verse 17. But also go before him the spirit and power of Elijah. And he's quoting scripture. He's quoting Malachi chapter 4. You're going to see the prophecies of God made to the church fulfilled. That's what we're waiting for. Now let's look at one more thing right quick. Verse 24. Miracles of God. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived... She hid herself for five months, saying, The Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me and took away my reproach. I'm going to have a baby, and I'm an old woman. This is a miracle of God. Now, what do we need to do, and what's this all about? Christmas is coming. Looking forward. Christmas is not just another day we celebrate backwards. Christmas is the day we celebrate forward. The beginning of Christmas happened in the church. It didn't happen in anybody's home. It didn't happen at the synagogue. It happened at the church. It happened at the temple. It happened with the priests of God. It happened with the temples of God. It happened with the heaven coming down and talking to these people and telling them, Hey, God's coming Jesus is coming again, and this Christmas, we look forward to that coming. Now, what we need to start watching is not just Israel, but the church. Did you know that you can have this same peace, this same love, this same joy in your home right now? And you can have it for this Christmas right now. What do we do? Well, we take the supernatural book that God has given us, or this love letter that he wrote to the church, and we start reading it in our home. Men died to get this in your hands, in your language. We read it in our homes. Every day, if possible. And we pray in our homes. And we sing in our homes. It may sound like cat squalling. You ought to hear me and the boys in fact, we were, singing, <laughs> we were singing one the other day, and the girls, all my granddaughters just started laughing. They quit singing just started laughing. They were laughing at us. But we sang it anyhow. It's amazing what praising can do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's amazing what praising can do. Hallelujah. I don't worry when things go wrong. Jesus fills my heart with a song, and it's amazing what praising can do. Hallelujah. Now, they laughed at us, but God listened. 
So take that. We just have a good time in God in our house, in our homes. We just enjoy God, and He enjoys us. That's what Christmas is all about. God always has a starting place. I met Jeannie when my house burned down. It was not good circumstances. My house was still smoking and smoldering when she showed up. But that's the day she showed up. It's been better ever since. It may not be good circumstances when God gets a hold of you and says, Hey, tick, 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 look at me. But it will be the best thing that ever happened to you if you will follow God. Bow with me, please. Father, thank you for this word of God. Thank you for this wonderful history and story in the Bible. God, do it again. Lord, come quickly. Maranatha, amen.